Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 11 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In earlier lectures, we have discussed primarily about what are the different layers of the earth in terms of physical properties as well as in terms of mechanical properties. As a result, because of the development of convection current primarily driven by variation in temperature across the depth, there will be movement of different plates across the globe. As a result of this, primarily at the boundaries where the two plates are coming in contact with each other, there will be development of shear strain, there will be accumulation of shear strain. Subsequently, over the period of time, when the stresses which are getting accumulated is more than the in situ shear strength of the material, the material will undergo failure. As I mentioned that across the globe, there are different kinds of plate boundaries. Some are transform plate boundaries, some are uh, convergent plate boundaries, some are divergent plate boundaries. So, depending upon the type of movement which are dominating at a particular plate boundary, the two plates might be moving towards each other, they might be moving away from each other or there is slight pass movement with respect to each other. As a result of this movement and the energy which is getting released when the in situ stresses are more than the shear strength of the soil uh, of the material involved, there will be release of energy in form of earthquakes. This is the general understanding about earthquake. Later on, wherever the earthquake is happening, there might be release of seismic energy from the source along the propagation medium like between the source where the earthquake has actually happened and if you take into account the building damages or the casualties or induced effect, these two location might be at certain kilometer distance, may be 200 kilometer, 500 kilometer radial distance away from the away from each other. As a result, whatever seismic waves are getting produced at the focus of the earthquake will be interacting along the propagation medium. Again, the propagation medium is also consisting of rocks. There will be heterogeneity present in the medium. There might be gaps also present. Unconformity might be present in the medium. As a result, whatever was the characteristics of ground motion at the source means how much is the frequency content, how much is the amplitude of motion generated at the source that will continuously undergo modification along the propagation path. Subsequently, once it reaches to a particular site, there will be other phenomena which we will be discussing in today's class. So, collectively whatever was generated at the source will subsequently undergo modifications whether it is because at the source, whether it is because along the propagation path or whether at a particular site of interest where one is interested to find out how much is the earthquake loading, how much is the forces applicable to trigger any induced effect such as landslide, such as liquefaction. So, in today's class, we will be discussing about what is ground motion, what is primarily the simulation because many a times what we have seen that earthquake occurrence in particular region, if you take into account the Himalayas, the, the seismicity has been building up, there are earthquakes for centuries and more than centuries. But if we take into account the ground motions which are available, regional ground motion records hardly for last 45, 50 years in which ground motion records are available. Again, if we take into account uh, the ground motion which might have been generated during deadly earthquakes such as 1897 Shillong earthquake, 1905 Kangra earthquake, 1833 Bihar Nepal earthquake, 1934 Bihar Nepal earthquake. So, these are first thing when I say 1833 is the year in which the earthquake has happened and Bihar Nepal is the region in which primarily the epicenter was located. Similarly, with respect to Kangra earthquake, so 1905 there was an earthquake in Kangra. Now, if we take into account the damages, the damages, the casualties, loss of lives, uh, again failure of utilities, whatever were available during that particular earthquake time, those are well documented. But in order to understand what will happen if similar kind of earthquakes which happened during 1905, which happened during 1950 Assam earthquake, which happened during 2005 Kashmir earthquake or any other earthquake which had happened before actually earthquake recording had started. So, in order to understand those damage characteristics and to see how, what will be the damage scenario if similar earthquakes 
are going to get repeated during uh, the present time or if you are going to construct an infrastructure at present for which might be lasting for next 25, 35 years, what is the potential ground motion one should take into account such that what has, uh, whatever has been experienced in the past in terms of building damages, in terms of casualties can be minimized to significant extent that will only be possible if there is a way we can find out what is the level of ground motion, what is the characteristics of ground motion which might have been triggered during 1905 Kangra earthquake, 1897 Shillong earthquake or any other earthquake for which actual ground motion is not available. So, as the name suggests in today's class we will be discussing about what is ground motion simulation. Simulation means there is no uh, uh, recorded ground motion, but what we are trying to do we are trying to synthesize taken into account significant parameters, significant number of parameters which are representing the phenomena happen during a particular earthquake. So, we take that into account so that we should be able to synthesize, we should be able to simulate, we should be artificially able to create ground motions. Ground motions again if we take into typical ground motion which are available at present in terms of records that is acceleration time history, displacement time history or velocity time history. Similar thing we are trying to simulate artificially rather waiting for major earthquake or great earthquake to get I mean to be to be witnessed in the near future and then we will take that record to analyze the safety of existing infrastructure or to go with design of new infrastructure. So, primarily when we discuss about ground motion simulation we, it, we are trying to understand what will be the characteristics of ground motions for which actual ground motion record firstly either it is not available or if we are interested to generate the second part if we are interested to generate ground motion prediction equations or some empirical correlation which will give an understanding based on empirical correlation that what will be my spectral acceleration at different different periods. So, again we will go with ground motion prediction equations. These are regional empirical correlations which are primarily based on a the larger set of ground motion record, but as we mentioned many a times what will happen that regional ground motion records are not available. As a result you are interested to develop ground motion prediction equation or these are also called as attenuation relation. So, what will happen we are interested to develop some empirical correlation for a regional earthquakes, but whatever database is required to develop these empirical correlations are not available. Primary reason is number of ground motion recording instruments are not uniformly distributed in a particular region. Secondly, even if there are records since last 35, 40, 45 years not all the earthquake magnitudes have been covered in such ground motion records. Primarily we might be witnessing different earthquakes all along the Himalayan boundary, but if we take into account those are in the range of maybe uh, 3.5 to as high as maybe 6.5, 6.8, 7 magnitude. But on the contrary if we take into account uh, last 100, 150 years there have been in incidences of great earthquakes also. So, that means whenever we are taking into account the existing database and try to develop ground motion prediction equation there are gaps, gaps in terms where there is no recorded ground motion to develop this empirical correlation. When do not have any recorded ground motion and we are developing uh, an empirical correlation using available database that means that database will not be applicable to predict ground motion because of maybe uh, the magnitude of the earthquake for which the database is not accounting. So, if the database is not having above 7 magnitude earthquake record and you are developing ground motion prediction equation then certainly that ground motion prediction equation cannot be used to predict ground motion properties for any earthquake having magnitude above 7. So, the ground motion prediction equation also requires many a times the simulation to be done on significant scale such that all magnitude earthquakes all hypocentral distance as, as we know that whenever earthquake is happening very close to the site the ground motion will be significantly higher as the epicenter is far from your site of interest there will be significant reduction in the amplitude of ground motion. So, again when we are going with ground motion prediction equation development we have to take into account very much similar to larger set of 
different magnitude ground motion we also have to have ground motion which are covering larger distance of hypocentral distance such that if i am having a site located at, at one particular coordinate corresponding to this particular site there might be n number of seismic sources this is my site of interest so any of these seismic sources whether it, you are calling it as one you are calling it as two three four so depending upon the orientation of this particular site with res, uh, the fault with respect to the site and the seismicity with which each of these faults are able to produce earthquakes the ground motion because of fault 4 because of fault 3 because of fault 2 fault 1 will be different significantly different so how much significantly different depending upon primarily depending upon what is the magnitude of earthquake which has been triggered on fault number 1 on 2 on 3 and 4 and depending upon the relative position of each of these faults with respect to your site of interest we can say site 1 is closer so that means any earthquake which is happening on site 1 will have significantly higher amplitude of ground motion in comparison to site 4 and these kinds of understanding we can we can make so when we are going with development of ground motion prediction equation one is we have to have larger set data set because that data set will give us an understanding about what is the properties of ground motion and how it is correlated with respect to earthquake parameters such as magnitude epicentral distance and subsequently we can also bring into account many more parameters which are uh, resemblance of maybe propagation path resemblance of maybe source properties resemblance of maybe site properties so we will discuss in coming slide what are source propagation path and site properties which can also be taken into account while developing ground motion prediction equation such that whenever in the end one is able to develop an empirical correlation the the sole purpose of empirical correlation is to predict how accurately the future ground motion will be taking that prediction into account one can go either with respect to design of earthquake resistant building you can go with retrofitting of building or you can go with quantification of induced effect subsequently the findings in terms of seismic hazard analysis can also be applicable with respect to city planning city development and all that so how this will be used in seismic hazard analysis that we will discuss in lecture 12 and lecture 13 okay so when we are discussing about uh, ground motion prediction our understanding starts with seismic waves which are released during a particular earthquake so these if if you put a recording station what it will sense it will basically sense how much is the vibration happening at a particular site of interest wherever we have put our recording station and how this variation in the amplitude of ground motion is happening with respect to time so this is basically the signature of ground vibration or ground motion whenever we say any ground motion record is available that means we know how with respect to time the ground acceleration the ground velocity or the ground displacement was changing when the earthquake generated seismic wave passed through your recording station earlier also we have told and later on also we will tell that whenever seismic waves are produced it is not only one type of seismic wave there will be different types of seismic waves which will be so as each of these seismic wave pass through your recording station that will leave some signature on your sensor of your recording station that will be indicated in terms of how the acceleration how the velocity how the displacement value of the ground is changing with respect to time because of the passage of different seismic waves from your recording station now recording station can be installed at ground surface it can be installed at soil top it can be installed at outcrop condition it can be installed even within the ground so all kind of recording stations are available across the globe even there are recording station which use uh, downhole arrays that means recording how the ground motion is changing with respect to depth or at different different soil layer beneath the ground surface so such ground motion records are also available for, for understanding uh, uh, local side effect so these vibrations if you are putting a recording station that will sense the vibration other than recording station if there is a building definitely the building is going to respond with respect to that particular vibration so taking take into account how much is the frequency content of vibration and how much is the natural frequencies fundamental frequency higher mode corresponding frequency how many natural frequencies are there and 
the input uh, ground motion frequencies. Comparing these two, one can come up with uh, uh, the response of that particular building with respect to ground motion. So, when sensor is there, it will give you qu quantified ground motion. When building is there, it is going to tell how the particular infrastructure is responded to that particular ground motion. So, such type of ground motion which are sensed by the ground, if it is not weak, because usually some recording station there will be some threshold beyond which threshold the ground vibration will not be sensed by a recording station, because primarily it will not be of use as far as its engineering application is concerned. So, uh, depending upon what is the sole purpose of those recording station, the threshold for the ground motion amplitude can be set and different set of uh, recording instruments are also available to sense the vibrations. So, all these ground vibrations can be uh, detected and can be recorded by sophisticated instruments. Ground vibrations if recorded provide useful information about the earthquake. What useful information? When a particular magnitude of earthquake of suppose 7.8 had earth occurred during uh, 2015 Nepal earthquake, what was the ground vibration at maybe Kathmandu, maybe Pokhara, maybe Patna or any other region if ground motion records are available for that particular region. So, that means, even though there was an earthquake in Pokhara, how much vibration because of that particular uh, fault mechanism during that particular earthquake have been transferred to different different recording stations or different different locations. If we collectively get an information of larger data set of such records, definitely taking that into account doing regression analysis, we will be able to develop some empirical correlation stating that again in next 50 years, 20 years if another earthquake has possibility to reoccur, then what is the expected level of ground motion for my building which I am going to design, which I am going to retrofit or which for which I am going to assess the vulnerability and risk. So, all those things can be done using ground motion record. So, that these types of ground motion records are very uh, useful to understand the damage characteristics, damage in terms of building, damage in terms of induced effects. If you are talking about hilly terrain, then definitely the landslide, if you are talking about level area, cohesionless soil, water table is very high, you can talk about liquefaction. So, all these things will require some understanding about ground motion, which is likely to occur or which has occurred during an earthquake for which you are trying to understand what triggered so much of failure as has happened during 23 Turkey earthquake. So, this kind of uh, ground motion will give uh, real helpful information about assessment of damage during a particular earthquake. Such information is primarily required for earthquake resistant design for estimation of ground motion attenuation, how the ground vibration is reducing primarily in terms of amplitude of different frequency waves, how it is happening as the vibration is covering a particular physical medium. It can happen along the propagation path, it can also happen with between bedrock and the ground surface. So, how the attenuation is coming into picture, how the vibration characteristics are primarily reducing over distances. Then subsequently it can be used for seismic hazard analysis, which will also give you an understanding about what is the potential ground motion at my site of interest. As I mentioned, site of interest means at bedrock level also it can be there, it can be corresponding to different site classes also, it can be at corresponding outcrop motion also. So, seismic hazard assessment, further the output of seismic hazard assessment taking building classification into account, one can continue for vulnerability and subsequently for risk studies taken uh, potential intended use of that particular infrastructure. Subsequently, if ground motions are there, you can also quantify induced effects like liquefaction is there. So, how much is in situ strength of the soil and how much is the stress which are going to be induced in the particular soil medium by the ground vibration. So, that collectively will give, will give us information about whether a particular site is prone to liquefaction occurrence it is prone to landslide or it is prone to any other induced effects. Similarly, in, in order to find out damage characteristics, one can go with fragility analysis. So, taking into account potential ground motions and correlate with respect to the damage characteristics, one can also develop the fragility curve for particular structure of interest, for particular site of interest. So, there also you have to have larger set of ground motion 
for performance based design also in order to find out corresponding to uh, given system how the system is going to respond to a larger set of ground motion which are potential ground motions expected at a particular site of interest. So, we will not rely on one particular ground motion to find out whether the building will undergo damage or not because there are lot many parameters which can control ground motion and depending upon those parameters the performance of the building may change, performance of the infrastructure may change. So, we have to take larger set of ground motion records, larger data set of ground motion records. If you do not have recorded ground motion definitely we have to go with simulated ground motion. Additionally, such ground motion can be used to understand the damage potential even for future earthquakes or the if, if we are interested to find out how the damage during 1905 Kangra earthquake, how damage during 1950 Assam earthquake or 1934 Bihar Nepal earthquake had triggered. Again, if we have those recorded ground motion, we can use it because we do not have. So, we can take into account the simulated ground motion to understand the damage characteristic. What, what uh, actually went wrong whether the building was not properly designed, whether the ground improvement was not done or anything else which led to finally, the failure of the infrastructure. It can be building, it can be soil stratification. So, all those things require an assessment about ground vibration. Not only one vibration will be uh, possible at the site of interest, you have to have a larger set of uh, ground vibrations which are likely to occur and which are function of what is happening at the source, how it is modified at the uh, between the source and the site and subsequently how it is further modified at the site of interest. Now, as I mentioned many a times or majority of the times the regional ground motion records have gaps in terms of non availability of ground motion records for maybe intermediate magnitude, maybe for higher magnitude also, maybe for great earthquakes also. In such a case, if we solely depend upon the ground motion record and the region is uh, uh, likely to witness or has a history of witnessing great earthquakes also, certainly with this limited information which is having no uh, database related to great earthquakes, you cannot predict the ground vibration which is likely to occur during potential future great earthquake. So, we have to have an understanding about it and that brings us to ground motion simulation or synthesis of ground motion. So, the requirement of ground motion cannot be fulfilled only by recorded ground motion primarily because ground shaking due to earthquakes originated at distance are required. So, you need not be only taking the ground motion which is from regional earthquake, but even at larger distances. For performance based design also you have to have a larger set of ground motion and significant variation which are uh, which are possible at your site of interest you have to take those potential variation into account while developing a larger data set of ground motions for performance based analysis. Similarly, in order to find out nonlinear dynamic analysis which will take into account significant variation in terms of strain energy, we have to have significantly larger variation in terms of ground motion properties which cannot be accompanied, which cannot be taken into consideration with limited set of ground motion data. So, actual ground motion data set though the data set is large, but if you take in terms of magnitude whether you take in terms of distance range it is covering that might be having some limitation. In order to use solely that particular data set for performance based design for non-linear analysis or even for fragility analysis for damage characteristics assessment. So, in order to further to understand about damage scenario many a times we are discussing about smart cities damage scenario means we will also take into account what is the potential region which are expected to undergo more damages primarily because of ground vibration, primarily because of building, primarily because of induced effects. So, what I mean e all these regions are potentially controlling the damage. However, if you are going with smart city planning we can take this thing into account well in advance before actual execution is starting. There, this will help in identifying potential regions which are lesser prone to earthquake and its induced damages and the region which are more prone to earthquakes and its induced damages. Accordingly, we can find out what should be the site which are relatively safe to be used for hospital construction, to be used for rehabilitation, to be used for uh, maybe relief camps or where medical supplies, essential item supplies can be stocked during any particular kind of earthquake or 
other seismic event. So, for these things also one has to have very accurate information about what are the location which should be used for important supplies, for relief camps, for hospitals and what are the area which can be marked as relatively safer, but moderately safer also can be marked over there, because not every kind of infrastructure you can only de de develop in uh, extremely safe regions. So, there are other regions also, where, where also some kind of construction will be happening. So, there what we can do, we can take into account what is the potential ground motion likely to occur accordingly, whether ground improvement is required, you go with ground improvement. If that has to be strengthened in terms of infrastructure, then superstructure should be uh, strengthened accordingly. Again to quantify induced effects, as we, district, uh, we witnessed during 1934 uh, Bihar Nepal earthquake, a larger area witnessed slump or there was uh, liquefaction which was witnessed during 1934 earthquake, even some of the areas witnessed liquefaction during 2015 Nepal earthquake. So, again we need not wait for liquefaction to occur, but if we have larger set of ground motion that will give us like actually how much the amplitude of ground motion which will be loading your in situ soil medium. Thirdly, in terms of developing design response spectra, for major projects we can go with site specific design response spectra, which will be taken into account how much is the regional faults, what are the seismic activity of those faults, what are the past seismicity of those faults, taking collectively those in rational manner, what is the design response spectra or response spectra at your site of interest, which is only dedicatedly developed for that particular site. So, it can be used for seismic design of the particular building and subsequently uh, it can be continued for vulnerability studies as well. To find out what, how the local side effect is uh, playing the role, many a times whenever vibration are transferred from uh, uh, source to your site of interest at the bedrock medium, the vibration will be relatively small, but because of local soil which is available between bedrock and the surface the vibration many a times undergo amplification and this amplification can be may be 1.1 1, 1 times also, it can be as high as may be 3 to 4 times also, 5 times also, which has been witnessed during past earthquakes. And uh, more about this uh, amplification because of local soil, we will discuss in uh, later lectures, we will be discussing about ground response analysis. So, in order to find out again how the amplification during different earthquake or different vibrations are happening at a particular local soil, we have to have an understanding about what is the local soil, uh, what is the ground motion. If exposed to the local soil, then there will be change in the amplification. So, if you take one or two uh, uh, input motion, then certainly we will not be taken, we will not be touching upon the entire range of amplification which the soil can undergo at different different amplitude of ground vibration. So, for this also we have to have larger data set, since larger data set is not available we can go with ground motion simulations. Similarly, in order to perform risk and vulnerability studies also one has to have larger data set of ground motion records. Now, this is uh, in a nutshell the entire problem that means we are talking about something which has happened at the source that means there was building up of strain energy, when the corresponding stresses exceed the in situ shear strength of the medium available in this particular region or on both sides or how much is the strain energy could be accumulated after uh, up to certain distance and after that there was release of strain energy along the fault plane. So, what will happen? There will be release of energy and there will be propagation of seismic waves in all the directions in three dimensional space. So, this is happening in three dimensional space, the, uh, the, the seismic energy was released at one particular point or in a particular area which is called as rupture area and then it started propagating in all the three dimensional space, it, it started uh, uh, in terms of seismic waves which are actually propagating in all the direction with respect to this rupture area. Now, between this particular source and your site of interest, it is actually undergoing lot of amplification. So, it should go like this, because if even if it goes through local soil, because of properties of local soil, 
the ground vibration will not be able to propagate longer distance as far as local soil is concerned. So, primarily we will take into account this as the propagation medium or propagation path. So, this is a propagation path. Now, this particular propagation path if we see there will be lot of heterogeneity there might be uh, uh, yeah, heterogeneity primarily and secondly whatever started at the source it is actually expanding in three dimensional space. So, in order to conserve the energy as it is going more and more and uh, away from the epicenter the, there will be attenuation in terms of wave energy. So, this is starting from the source and then along the propagation path once we will discuss about uh, different kinds of wave, we will understand that when any kind of seismic wave is passing through a particular medium, there will be oscillation in the medium, there will be particle displacement in the medium. Depending upon which kind of wave we are targeting, different kind of movement will be happening. As a result of this, there will be development of heat, there will be particle oscillation. So, that will also consume some energy, heterogeneity is also consuming some energy. As a result, whatever seismic wave or seismic energy was released at the source, significant portion of the energy has been modified at the scattering at the source itself because of an elastic attenuation because of heat again it is um, lo losing. So, there will be every time there will be attenuation or there will be reduction in the amplitude of vibration for different frequency content. Finally, the vibration reaches at the bedrock level or maybe engineering rock and then we can say weather rock and engineering rock is there. And then subsequently because of dynamic soil properties which are available to the soil medium available beneath the foundation and above the bedrock medium. This particular medium is also going to offer resistance to external loading depending upon how much shear strain is mobilized by this particular loading in your local soil. So, again dynamic soil properties will again alter your vibrations collectively if you take into account something happening at the source, there is large area which is undergoing rupture, then followed by scattering is there as you move away from your source and uh, towards your site of interest and elastic attenuation is there, heat is there which is happening. Finally, once it reaches a particular site of interest, you are having local soil which is again playing a dynamic role in terms of offering resistance to external loading and subsequently transferring the motion from bedrock to the surface. So, overall if we and you, you take into account this is maybe your building on which you are interested to find out what will be the damage characteristics or if you are going to go with the design of this particular building, you can find out based on this process how much is the earthquake loading. Thirdly, if this is your recording station, what it is going to sense? It is basically going to sense whatever was the vibration generated at the source modified along the propagation path further modified along the local side. So, collectively all this modified ground motion is the vibration which is going to be sensed at your recording station, which further we will be used in, in case of seismic hazard analysis, in case of building damage and this is a vibration which actually is absent for larger magnitude earthquake, it is basically absent for maybe higher hypocentral distance, which we are trying to understand or generate using synthetic ground motion model. So, whenever we are going with variables of synthetic ground motion model that means, we have to find out the parameters which will help us in understanding accurately what is happening at the source, what is happening along the propagation path, what is happening at the local site level. If we are able to capture all these parameters into account accurately that means, we will be able to simulate whatever would have been the ground motion uh, say an example for 1934 earthquake. 1934 earthquake generated somewhere over here, but as a result of which I am able to simulate the ground motion, how much will be the ground motion may be at Patna, may be at Lucknow or any other site which is may be in 300, 400 kilometer, 500 kilometer radial distance with respect to the epicenter of 1934 earthquake. So, I can take that into account and generate ground motion which I can use if I am going to generate, uh, if I am going to design an important building, I am going to construct that building, I can simulate that ground motion, maybe do performance based analysis or using simulations also I can find out corresponding to this particular ground vibration, what will be the response of my building. I can generate design response spectra, I can find out how much is the earthquake uh, uh, 
uh, resistant design uh, earthquake loading which has to be taken in earthquake resistant design of the structure. So, these are the variables which basically you have to take into account which can be called as source variable, propagation path variable and site variable. We have to take certain parameter which will be able to capture what is happening at the source, what is happening at the site, which is happening at the uh, what is happening along the propagation path. If we are able to simulate, if, if we are able to capture those um, effects by means of different parameters and collectively bringing that how subsequently the vibration generated the source is getting modified as it is moving away from the source and reaching to the site of interest, we will be able to simulate those ground motions as accurately as possible. So, a synthetic ground motion model evaluates the ground motions or simulates ground motion at a specific site due to a target earthquake. Usually, we will be interested to find out where the earthquake is happening and how bigger is the earthquake. So, primarily related to the magnitude of the, of the earthquake and at some known hypocentral distance, I can say like what if the 1897 earthquake is going to get repeated, whether my building will be able to sustain that earthquake, if I am going to design a new building or assessing the safety of an existing building. So, what I will do? I will try to generate 1897 earthquake, try to see the response of that particular building. Of course, I will take into account all the parameter which may come into picture affecting the 1897 earthquake simulation to a particular site of interest. So, that I have to take into account. I cannot simply generate one ground motion and do the analysis in terms of safety, in terms of uh, damage characteristics assessment. So, the accuracy of synthetic ground motion uh, generated depends how accurately one is able to find out or simulate or capture source effect, propagation path effect and site effect. Now, source effect that means what is the epicentral coordinate? That means, how far is the source with respect to the site? What is the focal depth? Where the uh, release of energy has actually started? Or where is the focus located with respect to the ground surface? Strike, what is the orientation of your fault with respect to north? Dip, what is the orientation of your fault plane with respect to horizontal? Even fault plane, uh, fault mechanism also can be brought into account, whether it was normal faulting, whether it was stack slip faulting, whether it was reverse faulting rupture length. If a fault is extending like 500 kilometer distance, not the entire length of the fault will undergo rupture during a particular earthquake. There will be some dimension, some finite dimension, but certainly not the entire length of the fault will undergo rupture. So, how much is the area, how much is the length, how much is the width which has undergone rupture to create a particular earthquake. So, one can take that into account then target event magnitude, how much is the magnitude of the earthquake which might have triggered or which I am expecting to trigger during the design life of the structure. Focal mechanism I have already highlighted, directivity effect like with respect to the site, what is the orientation of the fault, because generally the ground vibration which are going to be recorded along the direction of fault movement and perpendicular to the fault movement that will be different. So, in order to account that one has to also take into account the directivity effect. Then coming over to path characteristics, path characteristics means what is the in situ strength of the path. So, path property, strength properties, frequency content modification. Now, something has generated at the source, it is continuously propagating. So, it is like some vibration you have left at the source and now it is continuously propagating through a medium which is also offering resistance because it is also having some shear strength parameter how much is the modification in those frequency content. Third one is attenuation as I mentioned it is moving away from the source. So, they, it is actually expanding in three dimensional space, there will be loss of energy uh, and then there will be a heterogeneity present in the medium, there will be heat generated because of particle oscillation. So, all these will be responsible for modification or attenuation in your ground motion characteristics and geometric spreading as I mentioned earlier, it is moving basically in three dimensional space. Then site characteristic means what is the site condition where you are interested to simulate ground motion, whether you are interested to simulate ground motion at rock medium, outcrop medium or you are in, uh, interested to simulate ground motion at maybe different site classes are there, maybe site class A, site class B, site class C, D, E. So, which, uh, which is the site condition at which you are interested to find out the ground vibration 
also can be taken into account coordinate of the side that basically will give you what is the relative position of your side with respect to your focus what is the relative position of side with respect to fault orientation then range of frequency content of interest generally this will be important so that one can uh, take at least the frequency in which your building natural frequency may vary frequencies in which your soil natural frequency may vary so that range what is the range in which i am interested to find out how much modification from the source to your site of interest has happened in your ground vibration amplification as i mentioned whenever we are talking about the range in terms of frequency content i am interested like particular frequency content whether between the bedrock and the surface whether it has undergone amplification how much is that particular amplification so that can be taken into account and then whether we are simulating with respect to weather rock whether we are talking with respect to engineering rock or whether we are talking in terms of soil medium so so all these information will give more accurately about what is site characteristics okay so methodology uh, generally we are having two models uh, or uh, two ways in which models work one is a point source model where the rupture so in point source model the process of rupture has been taken as the rupture entire process of rupture is happening just at the one source which is point, uh, point uh, considered as a point so brune in 1970 proposed this point source model to generate synthetic ground motion so that means the entire phenomena of earthquake occurrence was limited to single point later on so brune's point source model of 1970 was the first point source model after that in 1983 this model was modified by bur and introduce band limited white noise so that we can actually take into account what is the frequency content of interest and also we can we can narrow down what are the frequencies uh, uh, we are interested to simulate so this was done using white noise stochastic model and this model was called as sm sim later on it was realized that rupture is happening in a, in a finite dimension which is also controlling the duration of uh, vibration it is also controlling uh, uh, like it's basically controlling the duration because it's not at one particular moment rupture started and then ended so rupture has started at some particular point and because now a particular rupture length and area is uh, rupture length and rupture width is concerned so this rupture will propagate from the point of origin of rupture or point of initiation of the rupture to the entire rupture length and width that will define what will be the duration for which the ground vibration has been generated at the source so that can be done only in case of finite source model two models are primarily available one is called a xsim and second one is called as finsim model finite source model and xsim was proposed in uh, motosadian and atkinson in 2005 based on uh, finite source model so as per bur the ground vibration characteristics or ground motion characteristic because of seismic moment m not generated at r corresponding to some frequency content of interest can be correlated as combined effect of source which is given over here path and site effects so m not is a seismic moment related to the event for which you are interested to uh, uh, simulate ground vibration r is a distance you can say maybe hypocentral distance epicentral distance or any specific definition of distance i am interested f defines the frequency content what specific frequency you are interested to simulate vibrations so that is taken into consideration again when we are talking about source primarily we will be interested to find out how much is the scalar moment so which is defined as the measure of the size of seismic disturbance it can be correlated with respect to how much area undergone rupture how much was the slip involved there and how much is the in situ shear strength of that particular medium corner frequency it is the frequency below which the source spectrum decays so that that helps in identifying how much is the corner frequency of that particular medium which can also be related with respect to the seismic moment then seismic energy means how much was the energy involved in a medium in finite medium without taking any kind of energy loss so that is going to give you how much is the seismic energy which has been involved in particular earthquake event then another uh, parameter which will come into picture is stress drop before and after an earthquake how much is the uh, stress condition so that difference is indicated by the stress drop both the shape and amplitude of the source spectrum must be specified as a function of earthquake size so you can see over here 
two uh, uh, source spectrum which are given corresponding to magnitude m 1, corresponding to magnitude m 2, which are both the source spectrum have unique characteristic that is m not seismic moment times the corner frequency cube of corner frequency this is maintained constant in terms of source spectra corresponding to m 1 or with respect to m 2 in terms of uh, point source model which is uh, uh, omega square model primarily it was targeted to. Then coming over to further this parameter, so E no, E m not f which is indication of uh, source parameter it can be correlated with respect to other parameter where c is there, m not is there and then s times m not f. So, these other parameters c further can be defined as r uh, superscript theta f v 4 pi rho b s cube r not. So, r theta is consider a radiation pattern average value of generally 0 0.55 is considered for shear waves f not uh, capital F is free surface amplification which is given over here. Then V is partitioning whenever energy released in two perpendicular directions. So, then generally it is that particular partitioning of horizontal component east west and north south component uh, many a times it is taken as 0 0.71 rho is the mass density of the medium. B s is the shear velocity uh, uh, in the, in the uh, rupture medium and R naught is the reference station within which we can find out the source uh, uh, spectra is not significantly changing it usually referred to as 1 kilometer. So, corresponding to this the displacement source spectra can be determined as S a m naught f which is also given in this particular equation as equals to 1 over 1 plus f is any frequency of interest divided by f naught which is defined in the corner frequency. Similarly, corresponding to reference station the value of m naught f which is equal to 1 this is the condition of reference station corresponding to omega square model which is uh, primarily the point source model later on it was modified for area source uh, finite source model. Propagation path as I mentioned earlier when the waves are propagating away from the source, there will be different medium which will be encountered primarily rocky medium. So, you can see over here whenever with respect to this particular point when waves are propagating it is actually moving in spherical wave front. So, geometric spreading seismic wave travel outward from the source in terms of seism, uh, spherical wave fronts. In order to conserve the energy, the energy per unit area in terms of growing sphere which is actually increasing the area of the sphere is increasing. So, that means the volume of the sphere is increasing that means the energy per unit area will also be reducing that will be leading to attenuation in the wave characteristics. In addition scattering is there. So, this wave, wave scatter primarily because there are heterogeneity which are present between uh, along the propagation path between the uh, uh, source and bedrock medium available beneath the site. An elastic attenuation, loss of seismic energy due to conservation of seismic uh, energy due to primarily because of heat. So, because of heat also there will be some seismic energy getting attenuated or lost. So, that will come into picture. So, usually all these collectively whether you are talking about scattering and elastic attenuation that collectively can be determined by means of quality factor which will give him an indication about how much attenuation at different different distances is happening in different frequency content or different frequency waves. If I am talking about one particular frequency band, how much this particular frequency band is reducing its amplitude traveling maybe uh, 15 kilometer, 20 kilometer like that. So, accordingly when we can determine the quality factor for a particular region of your propagation path and accordingly one can also compare what are the regions which are high in terms of attenuation or which are low in terms of attenuation with respect to the site. So, this one an elastic attenuation because of this heterogeneity present in the medium though incident wave was like this, but because of heterogeneities there will be redistribution of energy. So, again we will say this was the incident wave when once it is leaving it is like randomly oriented and further propagating. So, as a result of which some content of energy will be propagating towards your site of interest some proportion of energy will be again redistributed traveling in different manner. So, quality factor one can determine using this particular equation p with respect to distance at different frequency content 
is given as z which is geometric spreading and it is usually the regional factor then exponential minus pi uh, pi f r representing the distance as well as the frequency content and then the denominator you are having the quality factor which is going over here. Local side effect primarily two things will come into picture one is amplification which is which can be estimated like here corresponding to different frequency content where z s is specific seismic impedance near the source and z f it is near surface how much is the average amplification. So, uh, average uh, impedance. So, taking those into account where you can find out z s with respect to rho mass density of the medium and b s is wave propagation velocity or shear wave propagation velocity in the propagation medium uh, through which the, uh, uh, the, the medium which we are targeting here. D f is attenuation it is used to model the path independent loss of energy. So, that can be rho correlated with respect to how much is the maximum frequency content in your simulation and any frequency content of the interest. It can also be simulated with respect to exponential minus pi k f. So, kappa value minus pi kappa f kappa value can be correlated with respect to actual uh, ground motion record uh, Fourier spectra. So, based on the linear slope of that particular record Fourier spectra one can determine the value of kappa and use it in order to find out the denomination factor. So, overall the simulated ground motion will be like Fourier spectra or acceleration spectra with respect to frequency content. This is the overall we can say like uh, spectrum available over here. The spectrum is used for simulating the ground motion. It is primarily inversely proportional uh, it is inversely proportional with respect to the corner frequency. How it can be used to simulate? So, we can say initially in ground motion simulation model initially there will be a white noise this particular white noise will be club with respect to uh, wind uh, function stochastic simulating function which will give you how much is the uh, frequency content of interest and then based on this we will be getting the wind noise over here. This particular wind noise once you transfer in terms of frequency domain you are going to get frequency content or Fourier spectra of wind noise then normalize it with respect to mean square amplitude we will get normalized spectrum in terms in frequency domain. This is like step by step how a ground motion simulation model works. Then normalized spectrum you multiply with respect to the ground motion spectrum or side spectrum at which, which represents what is the seismic energy source spectrum. So, how much is the seismic energy which has been release at a particular source. So, this particular uh, source spectrum will be there normalized spectrum you can multiply with this and then we will be getting the shape noise spectra which is basically indicating initially this was a noise which was a uh, noise which was curtailed by means of some uh, windowed uh, function and then now you are having more representation of the site recorded ground motion. So, using normalized spectra multiply with respect to uh, source spectrum you are getting now shape noise spectra do the inverse fast Fourier transformation and then you will get the final acceleration time history. So, when we are going with fin sum model again in finite source model whatever governing equation we have used we will use those to model the source propagation path and side effect, but many a times whenever we are doing the simulation we are not taking into account what is the area which has undergone rupture in uh, uh, point source model. So, that is why in 1997 finite source model of FinSim was proposed where the actual area which is supposed to undergo rupture has been divided into number of sub faults the, the triggering of earthquake will start from one sub fault and then as the rupture propagates to different different sub faults again those sub faults will act as point source and governing equation which we discussed in previous slide which will be applicable with sufficient delay this delay is an indication of how much time the rupture started from main sub fault and how much time it took for another sub fault for rupture to reach because rupture is started it will take some time to reach to adjacent sub fault then to adjacent sub fault and subsequently it is basically propagating from the point of origin of rupture to another point which is also a part of the rupture area but as sub fault it is located maybe some distance away from your 
main point of initiation of rupture. So, this particular time delay if you take into account in terms of uh, uh, adding up the contribution of source that is one point source which was available at the point of initiation of rupture and another point source where the rupture has just started with some time delay. You can club all those things and then we will be able to find out how much is the targeted ground vibration which actually started from the source. Subsequently, the propagation path and side effect that will uh, follow up the same method. Now, in FinSIM model what was found like if you are taking the if you are changing the sub fault size it is basically controlling your ground vibrations. So, later on taking into account the dynamic corner frequency in the year 2005 XM model was proposed where because the simulations were directly related with respect to dynamic corner frequency. So, the uh, the correlation or the dependency of simulation on sub fault size was terminated or it was removed. So, it is the major advantage like it is insensitive with respect to fault size which was not in case of FinSIM model. Conservation of energy radiated during rupture process which was also there in terms of FinSIM model, but it was not there uh, I mean it was not there in FinSIM model and only a portion of sub fault will be active at any particular part. So, this is the way it is given. So, we have to find out the simulation simulated acceleration spectra you can see here the number of sub faults along the length along the width of your rupture area which is given over here and we will try to find out the simulated ground motion may be at the point of initiation followed by this negative sign indicates when the point of initiation of rupture started and since that particular time how much delay is happening since the rupture reached to any particular i th and j th sub fault. So, this negative sign is basically indicating with respect to the initiation how much delay has happened since the rupture has started if rupture started over here. Now, it will start rupturing here then it will reach here and at the same time in the background there is time also counting. So, how much delay in this particular uh, process of rupture propagation has happened which is taken or indicated by this negative sign. So, that is how you club all the contribution related to all of these sub faults we will be able to find out how much is the overall simulated ground motion following the steps which were there when we are normalized like window noise was there then white noise was there then multiply with respect to uh, uh, source spectra and then we were getting the Fourier spectra and then subsequently acceleration time history. So, the, that process will remain same only we are not getting just one point source, but we are getting contribution from number of point sources adding up those contribution and subsequent time delays. Okay, so, this is uh, we have already discussed this part. So, this particular equation basically will conserve that the target moment seismic moment suppose we are targeting for maybe 7 magnitude earthquake. So, this particular magnitude of target event will remain conserved if you take up the seismic energy which was seismic moment which was released from each of these sub faults. So, if you club all the contribution from all sub faults there should be simulation or the, the seismic moment of target moment should be should be reached it should not be more or less than that. Then corner frequency uh, this is the governing equation where the corner frequency of each of the sub faults can be related with respect to an average how much is the seismic moment corresponding to all those sub faults and the path effect as I mentioned earlier also. So, path effect can be correlated with respect to all these information we have already discussed here in the previous slide also. So, ground motion simulated acceleration spectra considering one sub fault is there and subsequently we will be having corresponding to more number of sub faults. So, synthetic ground motion model has certain advantages first one is it can be useful in case adequate number of ground motion records are not available. Similarly, in case larger a magnitude earthquake or higher hypocentral distance related ground motions are not there you can use it for performance based design also you can use it where larger set of ground motions are required and we do not have so much of recorded ground motion. Similarly, for seismic hazard analysis liquefaction or one particular scenario based study if one wants to perform then again we can go with ground motion simulation. In terms of limitation it requires whether you are going with uh, finite source model or point source model one has to have an understanding about 
different parameters which can model your uh, source propagation path and side effects. And many a times because ground motion records many a times not available in region which are relatively less active. So, in such case you have to assume uh, similar models from uh, I mean these models from other regions which are having these models available and are having comparable seismic uh, uh, settings. Okay, whenever we are coming to ground motion prediction equation, so we, we just did was ground motion uh, parameter we simulated. We, we simulated some ground motion uh, model which was a function of some magnitude, some hypocentral distance. We also took into account uh, path attenuation, we also took into account local side effect, we also took into account maybe how with respect to frequency content the simulations were changing. So, taking all these independent parameter which are finally affecting your ground motion parameter. We can have a database where ground motion parameter is there and how the ground motion parameter is changing with respect to magnitude, hypocentral distance, maybe path attenuation, maybe with respect to uh, uh, failure mechanism, fault mechanism and then when we can do regression analysis to find out how each of these parameters are contributing to your ground motion model. So, this is one typical uh, uh, ground motion prediction equation where the peak ground acceleration natural log of peak ground acceleration is a function of some function of which will be determining the functional form uh, based on regression analysis with respect to magnitude with respect to hypocentral distance. Third functional form has combined effect of magnitude hypocentral distance and then subsequently many more parameters which are basically controlling your simulated ground motions. Now, depending upon how much information related to source, site and propagation path are available, the functional form of ground motion prediction equation can be very simple to very complex. So, it depends upon how much parameter is available for doing the regression analysis. So, this is one example we have taken from NDMA report 2010. The governing equation is given over here. SA is spectral acceleration normalized with respect to G. C 1, C 2 up to C 8 are the regression coefficient, m is the magnitude, r is the hypocentral distance and consider like v 1 is interested, this is a numerical uh, based on the ground motion prediction equation. So, one has to determine how much the mean peak ground acceleration because of an earthquake of magnitude 6.6 .6 on mag moment magnitude scale, which is possible because of source located at 100 kilometer away from the location. Again the focal depth of the earthquake is also given as 30 kilometers. So, using focal depth as well as the epicentral distance we can determine the hypocentral distance. Once the hypocentral distance is given over here, so 100 kilometer is epicentral distance, 30 kilometer is focal depth. So, using this, this is your site, this is your focus, this is focal depth and this is this is epicentral distance. So, using this epicentral distance, so using this we have determined the value of hypocentral depth which is given over here and this is the definition of distance to be used in your ground motion prediction equation indicated by r. And these are like the value of the coefficients which are given corresponding to different different period. Your ground motion is changing with respect to different different periods. If you take into uh, account may be response spectra also. So, corresponding to each period which is marked on x axis your spectral acceleration value is changing. Similarly, with respect to ground motion prediction equation the coefficient values are also changing because the, the ground motion parameter is also changing with respect to their period of interest. So, typically one I have taken here as some values of the coefficients c 1 c 2 up to c 8 and then the standard error value also put all these equations these coefficients in this particular equation corresponding to magnitude of 6 which is given in the equation hypocentral distance of 104.4 kilometer I will be able to determine how much is the peak ground acceleration normalized with respect to g value. So, you can follow up this particular equation and the solution. So, spectral acceleration given in this particular equation c 1 c 2 c 3 with respect to this particular chart which will be given for uh, selected ground motion prediction equation and then this is the value of spectral acceleration. So, one can practice also taking different different value of the coefficient. You can perhaps download this report or maybe other 
published literature related to ground motion friction equation and you can practice it like now this is going to give me if 6 magnitude earthquake is going to happen at 100 kilometer from your site of interest 0 0.038 g is the spectral acceleration which is going to be experienced at my site of interest. So, I am not waiting for uh, ground uh, the earthquake to happen, but still I have an information about how much is the magnitude of this particular earthquake. If that is the target event, I can take this for earthquake resistant design even for induced effect quantification and then find out what measures to be taken in order to safeguard the building in order to safeguard the ground. So, one can practice more on this numericals and the overall objective was not to discuss in detail about the ground motion model parameter, but just to give you an overview about what are the model parameters available, what are uh, uh, widely followed model parameters uh, for ground motion simulation, what are the different components and how the synthetic ground motion model works, what is the objective of generating so much of synthetic ground motion and how a particular ground motion prediction equation can be used for a particular region. One thing to be mentioned over here is whenever we are going for ground motion prediction equation, these are regional equations. So, we cannot randomly select some ground motion prediction equation and start calculating the spectral acceleration or even for seismic hazard analysis. So, one has to be very careful in selecting a particular ground motion prediction equation because these are generated or supposed to be generated based on regional ground motion record. So, these records are giving an indication about the tectonic setting, seismic activity of the region and that is how these should be adopted also for that particular region. If any uh, uh, simulated uh, this GMP is not available for, for a particular region, then we can adopt similar GMPs from other regions where these are available and there is significant comparison or similarity in terms of tectonic setting and seismic activity between the region of your interest and the region from where you are adopting the ground motion prediction equation. So, with that I have come to the end of this particular lecture. Thank you everyone.